This is a shortish one, and it's called The Core. I looked so much I could not see, and in everything I looked at, only saw me. The sky isn't really blue, you know. Leaves of grass are not really green. I want to drink in all the beauty in the world, especially the things not seen. Many of the stars I see are not really there. Waves of light moving away, not entirely clear. I watch the birds till I stop thinking about flight. I gaze at the river till I'm lost in its light. What was I afraid of? Always hiding my eyes. I've got to face my truth and my lies. I've got to stop wanting to be in control. Being at peace is a much better goal. I'm just learning what eyes are for, to see with the heart, see right to the core. I just want to start by talking, well, I want to talk about your poetry. That's what I want to talk about. Um, when did you start writing poetry? Uh, poetry was the first thing I began writing. Um, when I wanted to write, which I didn't know when that was, I just found myself writing. Um, the first thing I did was write poetry. I've since discovered that um, um, two things, that it's natural for, for people to want to write at a certain stage in their life. Um, in other words, it's um, a natural desire to express something, whether it's grief, whether it's love, whether it's just um, understanding your environment. At some point in your life, there's this need to express on paper if that has been part of your education in any way. The other thing I discovered as, uh, as well is that the poems that I began writing were love poems. Um, and it turns out that love poems are secretly seduction poems, and seduction poems mm -hmm. are really some of the oldest poems in, 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 in poetic history. So, yeah, I began writing poetry because I fell in love, I suppose. And did you, were you aware, I mean, do you write sonnets? Do you, are you worried about technical stuff? Do you write odes? I mean, how, is, is there any sort of formality in the way that you write, or does it just free flow? Both. Um, I, like, I, like, I, like, um, I like the technical dis difficulties. Um, I, I write some sonnets, and then I desonetize them, and I write odes. Um, but mainly I like the constriction, um, and now I impose my own constriction on myself. Um, I like the tension between what it is you want to express and the form in which you have to express it. And so I move now more towards greater and greater brevity. You know how to say more and more, if you know what I mean. I do. And let me just take you back to love poetry and sonnets, because I, I love Shakespeare's sonnets, and most of them are love poems. Yeah. And you talked about constriction of form, and I'm quite fascinated by how many of our great poets do like the rigour yes. of a sort of tight form, the couplets and uh, the stanzas and then the, the couplets at the end. Um, but I'm fascinated because I'm not a poet. Why? Why do you want the risk? What, what, how does that help you in terms of formulating a love poem? It helps um, because without any rigour, without any formal structure, you really could go on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> and we need... Um, Good point. We need the discipline um, of tightness in order to express a lot. It's, it's not just the discipline of the tightness of the form, it's also the discipline of the rhyme um, and the discipline of the iambic, the, the, the actual beats. You, you inherit these forms, and into these forms you pour your personality. Um, the way in which you pour your personality into these forms is what makes it individual. Um, so when you ask why do we need these forms, it's the same reason that we need our houses to be in the shape that they are. They can't just be funnel-shaped and go off into infinity. Um, we need spaces, defined spaces in which to live infinite lives. Um, our cars are defined spaces. Um, the shoes that we wear, um, even our clothes follow the mold of, of our body. And I think the form ought to follow the mold of that which best amplifies. I think it's all about amplification. I think the more tightly coiled a thing is, the more it amplifies. 
I'm very interested in the word composition and composed because I think um, we can compose ourselves to read a poem and we can compose a poem. But it, I'm interested in whether there's a sort of concentration that poetry demands of us. What I'm interested in, can that concentration slow us down? Can our breath slow down? Can our blood pressure slow down? Can we take a time, a moment out, a, a, a time to sort of reflect? Um, like reading mindfully, I suppose, like being in the moment. Do you, do you feel poetry has a role? I, I think, I, I, I don't know, I'm sort of ambivalent about this. I'm not so sure that it's concentration that poetry really requires. And I think the myth of the concentration required for poetry is what has put a lot of people off poetry. Oh, okay. um, it's, it's made them think, oh, poetry is so difficult. I need to really concentrate. I need to think very hard to understand it. Okay. Therefore, it's going to be so obscure. I don't think it's concentration. I think it's... Um, what, is it more actually, heartfelt? I think it's more listening. I think it's more surrendering, actually. I think it's more... Um, immersion, more entering into. Um, I think it's more moving into the world, into the space of, of a poem. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said, we read poetry not to feel alone. And I, something that's come up over and over again in, in the course is people saying, I don't feel alone. Because, and uh, sometimes we don't have the words to say, mm. but someone else has the words. And you suddenly have that moment of recognition, that sort of eureka moment of, oh, I feel like that. Do you ever, do you, have you had an experience of reading a particular poem where you've just thought, it's like that for me? Yeah, um, I would put it another way. I'd say what, what really great, what really good poetry does is it coalesces that which you did not know you were feeling <laughs> um, into a body of feeling and words. Um, so it's another way of saying that we've got a thousand unformed poems inside us, which great poets bring alive from out of our experience like the conjuring of a vase in, in the air, in a way. Um, so yes, um, frequently Shakespeare does it for me, um, often. Rilke does it, Neruda does it, Whitman does it. Um, it doesn't, doesn't always have to be a whole poem. Um, Emily Dickinson would do it sometimes with two lines. Um, she's got a wonderful poem which, whose name I can't remember, which is really just words in a landscape. And when the first time you read it, you think, what connects all these words? But then you go for a walk, and you connect all those words. Um, it's, with someone like Emily Dickinson, it's almost abstract painting, um, mm. where you supply from out of yourself the only things that can make those words put so close together live in their context. And I, lo I, lo I love that about um, great, poet great poets and great poetry, that they don't say everything for you. Ben, yeah. I, I, just tell me about the poets that you like or have influenced you, or is there anyone you want to talk about? You know, yes, there, 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 there are many poets I've spoken about, um, Emily Dickinson and Neruda and people like that. But uh, there are also wonderful um, poets like Christopher Okibo, um, who's a Nigerian poet who died during the Civil War, um, who's a, I wouldn't use the word big influence, but it's just, uh, I discovered him when I was 23. I went back to Nigeria. I went to this shop, and they just had this sunburnt copy of his book called Labyrinths. And I stood there and opened it, and was transformed by it and transfigured by it. Um, and it began with these words: "Before you, Mother Idoto, Mother Idoto is a is a river. So think of this river. Before you, Mother Idoto, naked I stand. Before your watery presence, a prodigal." leaning on an oil beam, lost in your legend. And um, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a poet of, of great rhythmic beauty, um, very cryptic poet, and um, a poet who also believes in the power of ritual in poetry. Then there are poets like uh, Walisho Inka, who's also very, very, very powerful. Um, and there's another poem of his which uh, I learnt when I was very young, had a big influence on me. I anoint my flesh. Isn't that lovely? Mm -hmm. I anoint my flesh. Thought is hallowed in the lean oil of solitude. I call you all upon terraces of light. Let the dark withdraw. 
Yeah, so they're very many, very beautiful African beautiful, poets. Beautiful, beautiful. I, I thought I'd speak about as well. Can I ask about your poetry now? Should I read a poem instead? Please read a poem. <laughs> Shall I read a stillness poem? Yes, please. Okay. This poem is called Piano. Out of the shining wood, out of the quiet light of its sounding, a bluebird emerges, soars, and touches the sickle moon that rides a crescent cloud in the darkness of a blue sky. And then a tender music fills a dream of an Italian evening in the hall where a child dances alone before the sea of light. Out of the bright mirror, a clear world stands waiting. Do we dare enter or follow the strange call to a new shore where time is more? Where to dream is to love and to love is to give? There are no spaces but are full of unheard melodies, colors of spirit. Arches mirror the curved universe within as the sky mirrors our secret eternity. Out of the drawing, she sits as on moonbeams of delight. All things are made of a divine music, you know. When we're happy, doesn't it show? We glow as if the primal word plays so in us, shining through our transparent flesh, the God in us singing to the God about us. Could you give us a bit of context about the poem? I love the flow show. I mean, it's so musical. There isn't much of a context. I was on holiday with a, <laughs> <laughs> I was on holiday with a friend. It was the last night of the holiday. and. Um, we're sitting in the in the in the in the lobby of the hotel, looking out to the sea, and a beautiful breeze was blowing in, and I felt uh, I, in that rare state of pure happiness. And there was a um, a paper on the table my friend had been drawing, and she left a lot of spaces around the drawing, and I just wrote the poem around the spaces. And it was just a poem, just written out of a mood of um, a rare happiness. That's Do you all. mean piano in, as in soft? I mean piano as in soft, soft. and piano as in piano because piano, piano is playing okay. in the background. Okay. It was, it's about absence and presence. It's really beautiful. Yeah. But also so musical, just the internal rhymes. You see, I, I don't... I, Are you I, conscious of that when you write it or do you...? It's, it, is, it, is what, it is what the poem becomes as you, as you, as you write it. The poem, ah, it's secret rhymes uh, in many ways, inner music. Um, I think it's really important to stress that um, I'm trying to give a voice to happiness there, to, uh, to tranquility, to peace, um, to, to, to stillness. Um, and there isn't any concrete way you can do that except through evoking music and these sounds like glow, O, a lot of O sounds, and arch and R. So I have to use an R and O sounds, um, gentle, um, gentle words. I don't use too many harsh words because it's meant to be a musical piece as well. Um, it's a wonderful poem. Would you like to read another poem? <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. This, this one is, um, this is a much shorter poem. I like, this one is called The World is Rich. They tell me that the world is rich with terror. I say the world is rich with love unfound. It's inside us and all around. Terror is there, no doubt. Violence, hunger, and drought. Rivers that no longer flow to the sea. It's the shadow of humanity. There is terror in the air, and we, have put it there. We have made God into an enemy, have made God into a weapon, a poverty, a blindness, an army. But the world is rich with great love unfound. Even in the terror there is love, twisted round and round. Set it free, 
river flow to the sea. It's beautiful. Beautiful. I mean, I could say a million things about that, but the word terror now was loaded. The word terror is loaded. So much. Yeah. When did you write it? In, in, in the time when terror yeah. became loaded for yeah. us. Um, they've kind of ruined that word, haven't they? Mm. Terror is a very powerful it's word. It's a powerful word. But yeah, and, and a pow powerful word, powerful in an open way. And now it's got powerful in a very closed and narrow way. because like it's the got war on terror. War what does that mean? I don't know what terrorism. that means. Yeah. Yeah. You start to say the word terror and people's mind immediately goes mm. to terrorism. Yeah. Um, so it's like we've lost terror and gained terrorism. Uh, it's, it's, but in that poem, I'm echoing, I'm resonating that, of course, mm. but I'm also saying that terror is part of life. Yeah. Um, the yeah. darkness is, 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 is part of life. And it's important that we um, have a sense of it and have the courage to dissolve it at the same time. You reading that reminded me of when I, I gave a lecture in Los Angeles just after 9-11, and a lot of people said that they turned to Jane Austen yes. um, out of a need for an ordered existence, a, a, a life far removed from terror. Something you said earlier connects what, what you were saying just now, um, and I think it's worth really stressing it, and it has to do with the inner life. When you talk about literature, people turn to Jane Austen, they're not turning to a comfort blanket in, in times of stress like that. What they're turning to, they turn into literature because it's one of the most public ways, or let's just put it another way. It's one of the ways that we know, we know most in our times as a way of getting us back to the inner life. Um, terror, terrorism, news stories, horror stories on the front pages of newspapers, um, the fear and the stress. What it all does is it constantly makes us live on the surface, on the external aspects of ourselves. And that increases our stress. Mm -hmm. And what the best literature does is it returns to us our quietness. Because reading, especially reading privately, actually is an act of consciousness. It's an act of the empowerment of your truest individuality, your soul, your mind, your heart, your spirit, your being. It's giving that it's primacy again, it's given that, it's nourishment. One of the worst things that a climate of tyranny and a climate of poverty does to people is that it robs them of precisely the nourishment of that inner life, that life, the life of the spirit, the life of the imagination, the life of the heart, the life of stillness. And do you think um, the best of poetry can restore that or bring us back to that? Can, it reminds us, the best poetry reminds us um, Something, something really wonderful happens when you, when you, when you read. Um, I, no, I notice it with people. I, I watch people reading a lot. And they do something like this. They start to read something. And then they pause for a minute. And they look up like that. And there's sometimes a, a word or a dialogue or a line has, has sent them off into a space, <laughs> into a memory, into their past lives, into an experience, into a loss that was love, into a grief, into someone they haven't seen for a long time, an experience. They go off into this other reverie, world, yes. into this reverie. <laughs> um, and so what I'm trying to say is that there are two things. There's the act of reading, and there's what reading does to the mind and to the consciousness and to the spirit. Do you think that's different to other art forms, like looking at a painting or listening to classical music? Is there something about words? Yes, there is something about words. Um, music, music, is, music is wordless and speaks to the wordless part of us. You, don't, you hear a piece of music, unless, of course, you associate it with an experience in the mm. past. Um, you don't start thinking of trees and Atlantis and journeys and leaping off bungee, bungee jumps. and you, you, don't, you don't do that. You, you just enter into the wordless world of music itself. And with a painting, the painting, immediately confronts your eyeballs. Mm. It's, 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 a, it's an immediate act of visuality. Mm. Um, and of course it can remind you, it can, but the first thing that a painting does is that you, you see it in mm. its completeness. Whereas with a word, mm. you see the word, but your mind sees what the word is referring to. Do you get, you do get what I'm saying? I do, saying? but other things are happening too, because your heart's and responding and, your, and, your, heart's spirit responding and, and your, your spirit and your imagination. Your imagination. So it's all of those things. Where a lot I of think things. you're right. With the, with the visual sense, it is very immediate. Yes. And f 
it can be very full on. But I think you're right about words because it's layered. It is layered, and also words in, uh, words are kind of loaded. There's an archaeology of words, and there's a there's a there's a there's a structured archaeology of words. Um, but then there's our own private archaeology of words, and the word tree or stress that you encounter in a poem would do totally different things to me that, that, than it'll do to you. Mm. So we have our own private um, resonance with, 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 these, with, these, with these words. Words have a wonderful, stand in a wonderful symbolic relation with, with life. Um, it's, it's, it's constantly about, it's constantly about, 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 that, about that resonance. And it's not a resonance outwards, it really is a resonance inward, it really is. It's like throwing a stone into the, peb into the sea, into the lake, quiet lake of one's being, of one's consciousness, of all of one's rich internal life, sometimes rich internal sleeping life. Because um, there's a lot in us that sleeps. Um, there's so many aspects of our lives we haven't woken up to, haven't asked questions about. We, go, we wake up in the morning, we rush through our days, we have things to do. We don't have much time to just stop and ask these big central questions upon which our whole life hangs. Why are you living? What do you, what, what do you do? Why are you getting up in the morning and rushing through the day? What is the purpose of your day? What is the purpose of your life? One day follows another, and before you know it, you are at the very door of death itself. Why are you? What have you been doing? Why are you living? We, we, we very rarely... Um, unless grief attends us, a relative dies, a mother, or a, in my case, when my mother died, my goodness. You know, very rarely do we get things that wake us up in that way, stun us into sort of suddenly having to ask those deep, resonating, fundamental questions. And that's what literature does. It does it very slyly. It says, hey, let's <laughs> go for a walk. It, it appears to be at a party, it appears to, you know, to be entertaining you, and then bam, it plants this thing. And, for you're never the same. You're not the same. You're never the same. But that's that's when you ask me, um, what what does literature do? What does reading do? That's what it. That's what it does. It's it, it gives us a parallel life, and we need it. Um, the great poets often tell us that you know, um, life is not. You can't rehearse life. You're bam. You're right in it. You don't get a chance to say, okay, if I get a chance to, this is how I live. This is what this is. What, you're just like boom. You're in it. You go to school, and then the next thing you finish school, then you're in the world. You get married, you have a mortgage, you have a house, you have kids. And you're like, my goodness, I haven't, I haven't had time to rehearse this. I haven't, I'm just in it. But literature, it gives us this parallel opportunity, this alternative life. It gets, gives us a chance to slip outside our own life and enter into um, another, or enter into a poem.